This story began long ago. It was the third decade of the 20th century. In a land overflowing with milk and honey, a person died. Died from hunger. It might have been an old man who had a difficult life, marked by war and poverty. A man who had hoped to live out his days in comfort and peace, playing with his grandchildren. It might have been a man burdened by the usual cares of daily life, working the land, or building something, or perhaps bringing up his children. It might have been a young man, looking forward to his future happiness, love and success. Or maybe it was a child, who was just taking his first steps, his first attempts to understand the world. But one day, this person died. The statistics say he died 7 million times, maybe 10 million times, maybe more. But the final count can never really be known. But in the death of this person, a stranger to me, I am not involved. None of us are. He died and left no descendants. That's why none of us are his heirs. There is no one to mourn his passing, no one to exact revenge. No one to demand justice, nobody to remember him. But for some reason, there's no way to hide behind these words, and you can't help thinking about it. Death from hunger occurs when a person loses 30 to 40 percent of their body weight. Adults usually starve within about 65 to 70 days. Children die much sooner. There is little evidence in photos and films, but it does exist. And whilst it might be possible to turn away from the faces of the doomed, once you've seen them, you can't escape the feeling that these are the very same faces that you see every day. Except now, they're not so mortally wasted away. And you feel that if you look just a little bit longer at one of these old cracked photos, you'll start to see yourself. Is this the call of blood? Who knows? Is this the call of memory? Yes. In spite of a ban on any mention of them for many decades, their memory was alive, in unsaid words and in the looks of fear, which passed across the face of your grandfather or mother, and their memory still rankles. And when all the bans seemed to have been lifted, we told ourselves about the Holodomor, and we tried to tell others. But for most of us, hunger is little more than a historical fact, gradually receding into the twilight of the past. The emotions are fading. Why awaken them? It was long ago, in the early 30s of the 20th century. In a land overflowing with milk and honey, a person died. Died from hunger. They pulled out the oven, they know that there's bread somewhere, but they couldn't find it. They lived near that person. They were dying together with him. But fate was more merciful to them. None of the people we'll show in this documentary wanted to be a hero of the film. The very word hero scares them off. But we left them no choice, because it's only with their help that we can break through the stone wall of time and as time goes by, there are fewer and fewer people who experienced the Great Famine. We children didn't understand. I had a younger sister, Marika, but we didn't understand what was happening. We only saw that our father was depressed and mother was crying. We saw that all of our neighbors were in sadness. We saw that something was hurting our parents. Hunger, that is, total starvation, is when the human body gets nothing but water. It leads to the body consuming itself. First, the fatty tissue is consumed, then muscle protein, then the sugars of the liver. At the same time, the metabolism slows. 
Звичайно, хто не голодував, тому це важко, важко зрозуміти. Хто не course, it's hard to understand this for those who did not starve. I had to swell from hunger in 1933 and in 1943 in a German prison camp and in 1947. I know what it means when your whole being screams with the desire to find something to eat. Of course, there is a moment when you do not want to eat anymore because you become indifferent to the world. Some ten years before death looked into the eyes of little Grigori, the Grim Reaper was already taking his toll in these villages. The commissars were already on confiscation rampage. They took hostages from one out of every five houses. If you don't give up your wheat, we'll shoot. And the peasants who gave all they had, first to Moscow and Petrograd, and then to the Volga region. They gave, and then they died. They were exhausted. One and a half million of them. Of every three infants, only one survived. But of the first famine that shook Ukraine in the early 1920s, our hero knew not. That era of war, of all against all, is only part of the memories of his grandfather, Karp Gurtovi, and his big Cossack family of ten children. Six of Karp's sons perished during the civil war. Father was also taken to be shot when military groups came to the village. Makhno for two days stayed in Grandfather Karpo's yard. My grandfather was proud that Makhno asked him how to build a state, what to do so that the peasants live well, because they had an idea to build a peasant republic. During the first two to three days, there is a strong feeling of hunger. The appetite grows. Then there is nausea, dizziness, headaches and stomach cramps. Sensitivity to smells increases noticeably. If there is enough water, salivation increases. In the first few days, the body weight decreases by one kilogram a day. After that, daily weight loss lessens. But Grigory remembers well the period of collectivization. The Bolsheviks had tried everything to remold the farmers who they believed had been spoiled by the new economic policy of 1917-22. Finally, in November 1929, the Kremlin decided to revise the slogan, Land to the Peasants. Why, when everyone talks about collectivization, do they not mention the common cultivation of the soil, or soz? There was soz in our village, but not a collective farm. There was a poem, the father is in soz, the mother is in soz, and the children are walking in the road, with their hands up and their feet are in the river, and all of them are carrying out the five-year plan. Throughout Ukraine, the upshot of collectivization was the same. All that had belonged to you was no longer yours. You were no longer your own master. Your new master was the state of workers and peasants. And that state, with its despicable low-life mentality, was to take care of you. I remember that mother was crying, especially she did not want to give them the cow. They took one cow, and when they wanted to take the second one, mother did not want to give it to them. She held it and asked, what are you doing? I have small children. This is my last hope and my last support. But those people were relentless. In a fit of class struggle frenzy, the authorities launched decolocalization. They incited the poor peasants against the wealthy ones, known as kulaks. They fell into three categories. First, the counter-revolutionaries, who had dared to turn their weapons against the Red Army. In Ukraine, that was almost half of the rural population. They had participated in the rebel movement during the period of war communism. Another category was covered kulaks, those who did not actively resist, but were considered to be exploiting hired labor. Those faced arrest or exiled to Siberia or Kazakhstan. And the third category was kulaks loyal to the authorities. They were evicted to the so-called virgin lands. In the first quarter of 1930, 62,000 families in Ukraine were dispossessed. Karpa. 
The same deputies of the commanders came to my grandfather Karpo and dispossessed him. My grandfather was proud and he came from a Cossack family. His ancestor was a Cossack colonel. And suddenly they came. My grandfather had a big house. He had about 15 horses. It was a big family, 10 hectares of land. And he worked it with his hands. They came, allowed them to get dressed and get out of the yard. He put on his coat and went out of the yard with my grandmother. These people that cultivated the land were called Kukul, but they worked all day and night. I remember the moment when grandfather led the bulls with haystacks and mother went behind to spin. The elderly more easily bear the lack of food because of their slow metabolism. But children and adolescents have a more intensive metabolism, on average by 15 to 20 percent. Therefore, boys die first, then young men, then girls and women, unless, of course, other factors interfere hard labor, disease, or the cold. Why should we reawaken these emotions, returning to this terrible period of our history? Maybe because there are still a few questions that must be answered. Who and what caused the famine? Why did it become a national catastrophe? Was it genocide or not? All this is important, no doubt. But the most important thing is that millions of people were deliberately starved to death. Why did they allow that to happen to them? Do we find the concept of hunger riots during the Holodomor? The frequency of hunger riots among such a huge population was wiped out. And then there is a completely strange question. They want to kill you, you don't get food, and you are silent, what's wrong with you? It looks like people lost the concept of life. It sounds amazing, but not just the idea of biological survival, but the idea of life. Why? And everything comes down to individual families. What on earth did you use for food? That is a question we put to most of the eyewitnesses we spoke to. And the stories they told us sounded like pages from screenplays, similar to those about life after the apocalypse. We ate potato pancakes made from frozen potatoes. The upper part was white and the lower part black. These cakes were like candy for us. It was our salvation. I remember once the spring started, everybody ran to catch gophers. We lived on the edge of a village and there was a garden where more than 150 gophers came. Everyone tried to bring water and pour it on the ground to catch them, and when you caught a gopher, you had the smell of a wonderful soup at home. Starvation manifests itself externally in an obsessive search for food, often in spite of significant external barriers. Muscle tone of the stomach and intestines increase, leading to so-called hunger peristatilis. Roughly every two hours, the stomach shrinks in for about 15 to 20 minutes. The nutrient content in the blood decreases. Doctors call this phenomenon blood hunger. It is said that physical pain eases mental anguish. How else can one explain the fact that those who survived the Great Famine did not go crazy, watching the death of their loved ones? My feelings for my parents, for my family, of course, were dim. 
The main thing that rang in my ears, in my head, in my body, was the desire to find something to chew, to eat. We ate grass, rotten fruit, a few grains. The whole body was screaming, where can I find something to eat? You ask your mother, father, others to give you something, but they do not. What we saw on old photos was depression and stupor. Weak-willed people sitting and doing nothing when it seems logical to break through frontiers, to get out, to do something. A completely opposite reaction, the absolute deprivation of willpower appears. They are frozen in their premonition of death. And the only thing that could resist hunger was motherly love. Amate to plakala, to išla des. No, te što u hati bilo, hodila. Mother cried. Everything that was in the house, she tried to change for something to eat. And then, in 1933, I saw my mother yoked in a plow. A rich man, I don't know how rich he was, but there were a few women yoked in the plow, and he ran it. Mother brought grass, wrapped in bran and something like flour. It was such a tasty dish. And then mother cried, how I save you, my dear children? Recently, I read on one of the internet forums, stupid Ukrainians, why do you yell here about your famine? What right do you have to accuse anyone? You who are worse than animals. You who ate your own children. We are proud that because of evolution we are not just homo sapiens, we are people. But people are reduced to animals when the instinct of self-preservation forces us to eat up the corpses of the dead or even beat them to death. The black side of memory that cannot be erased. People eating human flesh, killing their own children to eat them. I can't have anything to do with them. I can't and don't want to even try to understand them. And they remained human even when overcome with physical torment and the fear of future torment. They began to hunt for other humans, breaking a terrible taboo. They were few compared to those who died, but did not break that taboo. So what? Who is to blame? They are themselves to blame, or those who turned those unfortunate people into savages. Daria, let's see, there is a dead person in the house of Miloshka. We came, Ivan was lying on the floor. I asked, why is he so small? He was covered with the fabric. We pulled down the fabric with a stick. Yes, there are no legs. We pulled out something from the oven. It looked like chopped meat. I don't remember his name, but I think his name was Sergei. He lived close to the school. His mother ate him. 
And when I wanted to go to where my mother worked for the rich master, as we called him, the plow, I had to see how the police put a big pot on the cart. There was steam and a woman was screaming, raising her hands like crazy. It was an hysterical scream. The policeman could not hold her. He pulled her back. She was not swollen because she had eaten something. It was not the first child. It was a dangerous time to walk through the village. Later, the feeling of hunger begins to fade. The appetite disappears and the person feels even a certain cheerfulness. The tongue becomes covered in a white fur. Inhaling the air, the person feels a slight smell of acetone. The appearance of food does not cause them to salivate. The person becomes irritable, sometimes can't sleep. He is pursued by pain, but this period of recovery is fragile. After this, the signs of death come, apathy, lethargy and drowsiness. It is crucial to set the record straight, in your own mind, in the minds of your community and the outside world. I noticed some kind of information boom around the theme of the Great Famine, around the time of its anniversary, which was officially established on the basis of the findings of expert historians. From the screens we hear the official assessment, Holodomor was genocide, a pre-planned action. The same comes from the rostrum of the United Nations. The long-awaited words, dangerous words though because they encourage us to think that the famine was the work of enemies from outside. They killed us. It was not us. We did not help them kill us. Could a communist be Ukrainian? Even feeble attempts of Ukrainian officials like Skripnik, Chubar and Petrovsky to find a balance irritated the Kremlin elite and especially Stalin. And the choice they faced was stark. Either you sabotage the cruel grain procurement and cease to be in power, or cease to be at all for that matter, or you starve your own people into submission. Those officials had no courage to do the first, and in the opinion of their superiors, did poorly at the latter. You see, there was a split. As an economist, I understand that this is a pointless policy and will lead to a dead end and can cause anything. But at the same time, I implement it because I was told to do so by the party. And the party is always right. It's something amorphous. They used to say, God told me so. I fulfill the commandment of God. Now, the party says I have to. What's the difference? There is no difference. The idea crushed the person. The person speaks, maybe even writes, and at the same time really fulfills the task. It was a full split. Neither in 1932 nor in 33 were Ukrainian leaders able to meet the demands for millions of additional tons of grain. Careful hints to that effect by Mr. Kosior put him in the shadow of his comrade Postyshev, who pretended not to see the hunger. A major party purge lasted over a year, from June 1932 to October 1933. Eighty percent of the secretaries of party organizations and 75 percent of officials from local councils were fired. But for the peasants, high echelons of power were aloof from reality. For them, the main problem was the enforcers, requisition brigades, manned by poor local peasants and headed by people sent from cities. They were to be feared. But why? Only 10 years had passed since the civil war. The memory was still alive, so a man with a gun made people scared. Of course they were aware of this hostility, but they knew that they had the power of the state and the power of the government behind them. In addition, obviously, there were other authorities in the town, a detachment of militia that came here if necessary. In addition, there was a prison in Bazurka town. When you were driven there, this meant that you do not exist anymore. That was the thing. People's fear was, of course, very great. Mama, 
Mom, tell them where you hid the bread, as you told me. There was a very good doctor in Uspensk village and he knew my father. He knew it would be hard times and he told us to hide the bread. We renovated the house inside and in a closet we made a space between the walls and covered it with bricks. And in the attic a hole was made and we poured corn, millet and wheat inside and then we removed a brick outside, took some grain, stuffed it in the hole with a hammer. At night we took some out and boiled it, then we threw away the evidence and put the brick back in the wall. They came, pulled out the oven, they knew that there was something there, but they couldn't find it. That's how we stayed alive. The requisitioners quickly found their way to the peasants' secret hiding places. They took everything they could lay their hands on, be it sacks of grain or the last handful of food. My mother hid a jar of wheat in the chimney. Near the stove was a bench. She hoped that in the corner nobody will find it. These requisitioners, after they didn't find anything in the village, they dug the earth in our yard and the yard of our neighbors. Then they came to us and saw the jar. What do you have there? He stepped on the bench, took the jug and poured out the contents. My mother cried, this is all for that little child, this is the last chance to save her. But he was merciless. It's in my memory until now. Until now, I painfully remember it. Why did they do that? Didn't they really have souls? Didn't they see these children in the house? We were young and already thin. I had already begun to swell. My sister was thin, and the baby Vera, she lost weight because mother had no milk and had nothing to feed her. When they broke into the house, they took everything. They shook beans and dried courgettes from the children's clothes. They weren't humans, they were monsters. The word beast is the first thing that leaps to mind. But there still remains an unanswered question. How come there appeared so many sadists who took pleasure in seeing people slowly die from hunger? Scientists claimed the perpetrators had no mental pathology, but their consciousness was raped and perverted by communist ideas. If there were psychological, neurological and clinical examinations of this person, then we should ask, who is it? A mass serial killer who saw what was happening and then continued to do his work. And any psychiatrist will say, no, this is a healthy person, but talk to him on social psychological topics and you will see that he was brainwashed with these ideas and that's why he was a lost person. It hurts to think that your people were a flock of spineless creatures who obediently went to the slaughter without any resistance. But there must have been resistance. How could a nation that for years had refused to be subjugated and in which the flames of war were burning long after the Kremlin had claimed victory, how could such a nation give up without a fight? And there was resistance. The people rebelled. Whole districts were covered with hungry riots. NKVD officers were unable to keep order. So regular troops were brought in. But the generals were not too keen on the idea, as the sight of starvation demoralized their soldiers. Little wonder that the local uprisings never turned into a real war, as the previous war and repressions had eliminated those who could have led the resistance. 
and therefore cleared the way to those conformist and unscrupulous. Things like the Holodomor stay in the regime of secrecy, where people talked openly only in the kitchen. Because of all these things, a generation of social nihilism was born. I would call it the syndrome of Joseph K., the protagonist of Kafka's novel The Trial, who himself leads his guards to his execution at the end of the book. This obedience to everything in any situation was laid in reality. Can you imagine people being killed and not taking any steps? Changes continue in the body. Some of them eventually become irreversible. They include muscle atrophy, severe weakness, a complete inability to move independently and swelling. A man swells from hunger. The swellings can become wounds which never heal. A decrease in body temperature, sometimes by up to 30 degrees, reduces the size of the heart and impairs respiratory functions. After that, a coma from hunger or sudden death from any unexpected strain. The swelling was so huge that my feet were like boots. My belly hung like a bag. My feelings for my father and my mother had been killed because the only thing that was in my head and on my mind was to find something to eat. I wanted to eat. Therefore my hand was reaching for grass, for anything that could be eaten, even a belt which we had in the house was cooked. All that we had to harness the horses, that was cooked too. The girl next door, my classmate, Dunyasha, I saw how she died in the spring of 1933 on the field. She was able to get to the field and there she fell. All the grass she could reach, she ate. The cart, simple peasant transport. In 1932, on this chariot, the yellow prince, hunger, rode into the courtyard. First, confiscated grain was loaded on it, and then the bodies of those from whom they had taken the wheat. This cart drove up and dead people were dropped in it like pigs. Then it drove to the cemetery, bodies were dropped into a pit, buried, and that was that. The people were driven in a cart, arms hanging, heads tilted. One day, one body was dropped into the pit, the next, two bodies. And when there were up to a dozen bodies, they were buried. There were no people to dig holes, people were not capable of it. It was like this, if two people had died and a third person was weak, they put him in the cart as well and threw him in the pit too. And they came the next day and saw this boy still half alive. Looking at them, they took him from the pit, but he was so weak that he died anyway. The choice between the lives of your loved ones and other people's lives is a heavy one, and sometimes there is no choice at all. Anna's father didn't keep guard of the field where hungry villagers dug up potatoes which had just been planted. For the small amount of potatoes which were later harvested, Constantine was sentenced to 10 years in jail, and on the following day a death sentence was given to his wife and children, as the authorities took away everything edible from their home. Do, do весни дожили, єлі-єлі. 
We barely lived to see the spring. Already in spring, my brothers and I were swollen. Our wounds were open. We ate grass, dug up frozen beets. Either by a fluke of fate or because of the shortage of hands for planting, in spring the authorities released Mr. Gonchar from prison. He returned, trying not to think that there was nowhere to return to. Dad came at 7 a.m. from the train and dead people were lying on the roads and also those that were in the process of dying. Father came and saw our lives. He brought rye bread. He told mother to put everything in a chest, lock it and give it to us little by little. She gave us some bread and locked the chest. My older sister was 17 years old at the time. We came to the chest and it was locked. We could have broken the lock because we wanted to eat so much. And then one day our mother forgot to lock it. My older sister got into it, over eight and died. She was 17 years old. If you can't manage, maybe you should run away. And peasants moved en masse to regions where the requisitioning of grain was not so cruel, and where they hoped to earn some food or at least to beg for it. From the neighboring Russian areas, desperate telegrams flew to Moscow. Local party heads didn't know what to do with the mountains of corpses and thousands of half-dead people. In their infinite wisdom, the authorities found a way out. They set up borders with special units and checkpoints. The flow of refugees was blocked. Meanwhile, the family of Grigory Gultovei was also on the run. Where to run away? To the Dnieper? What is near the Dnieper? We ran there. One night, Dad came into the house. And in the night he put me and Marika on the cart. Father took an axe and a bundle of clothes from the farm, and we ran away from the village. We were afraid to stop in the villages, because we passed some farms and villages, and there was nobody there. That was the period of the cherry harvest, but we couldn't get to them because we had no equipment. We entered one house, and there was a dead and swollen woman on the floor. Salt was scattered on the table, and the stove was still warm. Mother pulled a pot out of the stove, and there was still warm grass in it. Were there people in famine hit Ukraine who were not affected by that scourge? There were. In big cities, people just saw starvation. Cities barely managed to clean the streets of dead bodies, of those who, despite armed cordons, had managed to break into the cities, desperate to get something to eat. Thus, city dwellers, workers, teachers, doctors, bureaucrats and the like, couldn't avoid witnessing the Great Famine. For many, even for most first-generation urban dwellers, it was a grim reminder that at that very moment, somewhere in their native villages, their loved ones were were also dying from hunger. This instinct of self-preservation closed their eyes to the suffering of the children. And then you're even more imbued with the idea that you're receiving a ready-made plan in order to save you. To say, yes, you see them suffer, but it's done for a reason. The urban dwellers survived, although despair and fear severed their ties to their native roots. It was as if their little homeland disappeared and only the large one remained. And this large one demanded unwavering loyalty. 
if not out of conscience, then out of fear. And fear was building up. Ahead lay years of terror that would mop up the remaining few who still kept their dignity. People will pass on that fear through generations, to their children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren. I've heard that my generation and those younger than me are free of this fear, so I'm told. This fear of hunger, it always exists. Even now, the 1933 famine and even the famine of 1921 and 22 are so deeply rooted in the memory of the older generation, who is now 80 or 90 years old. The hunger is in their memory, and they are still afraid of it. If there is a little drought, people start to say that it could be famine and a poor harvest. But aren't we the descendants of those who starved people to death? It's hard to imagine yourself in the role of those who did the requisitioning in 1933, coming to your neighbors and robbing them of whatever little they had, being sure of your impunity and backed by the power of the state, paying no heed to a woman crying her eyes out, seeing the frightened eyes of her children and feeling no pity, taking the last of their food without a qualm and leaving them to die a slow death from starvation. And that's how these young boys would go around and look in 1933. You hide something on the stove or bury it in a pot and they would find it. Eyewitnesses say that according to a directive from the center, a quarter of the grain that was confiscated belonged to those who requisitioned it. Maybe that was the price of their survival. Could I snatch a piece of bread from someone else's child to save my own? Do we really have to answer that question? And what if the answer is yes? Do we have the right to judge our ancestors? And if so, when does the day of reckoning come? And who will be the judge? I see no point demanding repentance from enemies, sympathy from friends, and justice from the world. Our enemies will not repent and will never admit their guilt. Friends will be friends. They'll understand you without extra words. And as regards a proper judgment from the civilized world, one shouldn't forget that it was the same civilized world that used to buy our grain, when in Ukraine 17,000 people died from hunger every day. It was the same world which shook the hands of those who sold that grain on the cheap while its real price was human lives. And isn't oil now being sold for the same crazy price? And has mankind learned to resolve disputes by means other than war? And now we know that there was an evil power somewhere sitting in the Kremlin who gave these inhuman orders. But why? Here recently in the newspaper, one author wrote that there was almost no famine in 1933. And if there were difficulties, then they were in the name of building socialism. You know, it was burning in my soul. My sister Vera went to build socialism. The bones of my grandfather went to the foundation of socialism. Grandma passed away at the foundation of socialism. My classmates, my neighbor Dunyasha, they all went into the foundation of socialism. What is it? How to understand this inhuman social order? So, who can be the judge? I am an ordinary Ukrainian, born in the late 1960s. By a fluke of circumstance, I have experienced neither war, nor hunger, nor repression. Can I judge my ancestors and try to bring closure to the painful past? I don't know.
my verdict on myself will be subjective, at least unless I feel that the one who died is me, and the one who killed is me too, and the one who did not intervene and survived, all the while praying that trouble would not come to his house, that was also me. But is my verdict on myself more relevant than other people's judgment? Let them say who we are, all of us the most dignified and the meanest, as well as the grey crowd in between. We deserve the pillory, but we just as well deserve a heroic monument. This story began long ago, in the third decade of the 20th century, in a land overflowing with milk and honey. A human being died, died from hunger.